AQA A-Level Physics uh, for Turning Points option. Uh, this is video 11 and it's about special rel relativity. I'm going to do two special relativity videos. I'm going to squish it all into two videos. Yes, I'm going to contract it as I go through it quickly. Anyway, shut up. Um, basically, look at this. Imagine you're inside a train uh, and the train is moving at a constant velocity um, and uh, the track is perfectly smooth. Uh, all the windows are blacked out. Now, would you be able to tell if you were moving? Uh, in other words, would all of the laws of physics apply inside a moving train uh, as they would if the train wasn't moving? Uh, I mean, if you look at this ball, this ball is dangling from the ceiling there. Yeah, no problem there. Uh, if you if you dropped something, it would fall and you could do uh, equations of motion. If you threw something, then like a projectile, it would do a parabola and everything inside the train would be just the same as if it was outside the train. It's as though the fact that the train is moving has nothing to do with the laws of physics. If the train was accelerating, well, that would be different. OK, if the train was accelerating in that direction, then the ball would actually dangle like that, wouldn't it? Yes, but we're not talking accelerated motion. We're talking moving at a, a constant velocity. Now, uh, Einstein, when he came up with his theory of relativity, special relativity, uh, said his starting points were these two things, his postulates. Uh, a postulate basically means let's assume that these two things are true. And if we assume that these two things are true, then everything else follows from that. So these are his postulates. The first one, physical laws have the same form in all inertial frames. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means an inertial frame is just these x, y, z coordinates, okay? That's an inertial frame. It's a frame, a, a Cartesian coordinates thing that things happen in. And as long as it's not accelerating, you wouldn't be able to tell a, a moving frame from a static one. All the laws of physics would apply. The second postulate is that the speed of light in, in free space is invariant. OK, in other words, the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight full stop, whether you're moving in that direction, moving in that direction. If something's moving in that direction and something isn't, the speed of light to both of them is the same. And that came from uh, the Michelson Morley experiment. Yeah, that was a conclusion from that experiment. Going back to this slide, which was on the last video, if you chucked a ball at two meters per second, and if you're on a skateboard traveling at three meters per second, then the speed of the ball relative to the skater is two. The speed of the ball relative to somebody looking on is five. The speed of the ball depends on the speed of the observer. Light doesn't work like that. If the kid on the skateboard shines a torch, the speed of light relative to him is three times 10 to the eight. The speed of light relative to an external observer is three times 10 to the eight. The speed of light does not depend on the speed of the observer. And that's a, an amazing idea. And there are some consequences. If you do the maths, there are some consequences of that. And they are time dilation, length contraction, and mass increase. They are the consequences that come from the maths from Einstein's postulates. Yes, we're going to look at the first two in this video. Uh, we're going to look at time dilation uh, and a little bit at length contraction, mass increase. That's the next video. So the time dilation one. Imagine this. This is a very classic thought experiment. Imagine you have a clock that goes tick, 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 tick. Yes. And this clock is actually a beam of light which is bouncing between two mirrors. So the beam of light goes up there and it goes bounce and it comes down there and it goes bounce and it goes up there and it goes bounce, etc. 
yeah, a light clock, a beam of light bouncing between two mirrors. If the distance between the mirrors was three times 10 to the eight, then it would go bounce every second, wouldn't it? Yeah, be a big clock like. So uh, the clock is observed by somebody inside a moving vehicle and it's observed by somebody outside the vehicle. Now, the person inside the vehicle would just see the ray of light. Like we said, it goes up and then it comes down again. And that's the person in their frame of reference. That's what they would see. The person outside the vehicle would see the ray of light doing this zigzag. Yes, as the clock moves, the ray of light would be doing a zigzag. Yes, it would be covering a, covering a, a bigger distance. Now, the stationary, stationary observer would see the ray of light cover a bigger distance in the same time. No. OK, but not in the same time. Why? Because if it was in the same time, then the ray of light would have to travel faster. Uh, and that goes against one of the postulates, doesn't it? Yeah, the ray of light is not allowed to travel faster. So it's not in the same time. It's going to take longer. Now, what I'm going to do, and don't worry about it, you don't have to do this. I'm just kind of uh, showing off a little bit. If you've got the time measured by the, the moving observer is T, you've got the time measured by the stationary observer uh, is T dash. OK, the observer in the spaceship observes the ray of light moving vertically. So the, the, it's moving at a velocity V there in that direction. OK, the person inside the whatever was it, a train or whatever, sees that the person outside sees that. Uh, and basically, just from Pythagoras, if you want to pause the video and have a look, it's quite interesting. Just from basic Pythagoras and just fiddle with the numbers, we get this here. And it's basically the big time over the little time. The big time divided by the little time is this one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. And we call that doesn't actually call it on your specification, but every other one does uh, the gamma factor. There's the gamma factor or the Lorentz factor. Yeah. And remember, it's the big time divided by the little time. Yes, this is what it actually says on your formula sheet. The big time divided by the little time is this root one over root one minus v squared over c squared. Uh, we call it the gamma factor or the Lorentz factor after another scientist who did the math. Uh, T is the proper time. So T is the big time as measured by the stationary observer. Uh, T naught is the time measured by the moving observer. Remember that it's the big time over the little time. So the gamma factor is always greater than one. Yes, the gamma factor is always greater than one. If you weren't moving, yes, if you were stationary, the gamma factor would be one. And then if you move faster, it gets bigger. Here's a, a paradox. Now, what, what we actually said was that time uh, passes slower if you're moving quickly. Yes. If you like, time slows down if you're moving very, very fast. And this is a very famous thought experiment, the twins paradox. You've got twin A and twin B, uh, and they are twins. They're exactly the same age. And then one of them, twin B, gets on a spaceship and whizzes around the galaxy very, very fast. Twin A stays on Earth. Uh, when twin B returns to Earth, uh, his brother is actually much older than he is because time passed a lot quicker for the person who stayed back on Earth. It's called the twins paradox. Very famous. Time passes slower for the fast moving twin. Is this all theoretical nonsense? No, there's been loads of experiments. Yes, to actually show the difference in time. Yeah. Uh, due to time dilation. In fact, your GPS satellites uh, have to take it into account because they're whizzing around the Earth. 
yes? And they have to take into account time dilation to be as accurate as they need to be. A very early experiment was two atomic clocks and on one of the Apollo missions went to the moon and back. Um, when it came back from the moon, the two atomic clocks, which were synchronized, now they had slightly different times. Uh, and using Einstein's equation, uh, the time difference actually agreed with what you would predict. This is this is stuff that works. OK, it's not just totally theoretical. It's very important. Particles called muons. Now, this is an experiment that you need to be familiar with. Yeah, these particles called muons. You've got cosmic rays in the upper atmosphere. So rays coming in, all kinds of stuff coming in from the sun and whatever in space uh, and creating these particles called muons. And these muons travel very, very quickly, almost the speed of light. They travel look, 0 0.995 times the speed of light down to Earth. If the muons weren't moving, they would have a half life of 2.2 microseconds that's if they weren't moving so how long would it take the muons to travel that distance okay so let's say we detected how many muons there were per hour at a certain height you know maybe send up a big balloon or whatever and detect muons at that height uh, and if we detected 563 per hour at that altitude how many should we detect at sea level? Pause the video and do it yourself. Yes. Now, I've kind of chosen the numbers a little bit so that um, the time it takes 6.6 .6 microseconds is actually a multiple of half lives. It's three half lives. Uh, so 563 times a half times a half times a half about 70. So if we're detecting like 563 there, we should be detecting about 70 down here because three half-lives have passed. However, 457 muons per hour are actually detected at sea level. How do you account for the difference? Well, the fact is because the muons are traveling so quickly, ridiculously quickly, for them time slows down. And their half-life isn't 2.2 microseconds. It's actually a much bigger than that. And so much less of them decay. Yes, what we can do is work out the, the gamma factor for the muons. Uh, and you work it out yourself. And you should find that the gamma factor, the Lorentz factor, is about 10. And that means that their uh, actual moving half-life isn't 2.2 microseconds, it's 22 microseconds, okay, which is nowhere near one half life. A few things about the uh, gamma factor. If you look at this graph, it is only significant at very high velocities. This speed here is that's a fraction of the speed of light. So that's the speed of light C, and this is the speed V. Uh, and you'll notice that, you know, up to about 20% of the speed of light, it is hardly noticeable. OK, uh, and 20% of the speed of light is actually pretty fast. Once you start approaching the speed of light, then the gamma factor shoots up, doesn't it? Yes, if you're traveling very close to the speed of light, it reminds me of the um, the protons in the Large Hadron Collider that they, they travel at about 0.99995 something of the speed of light ridiculously fast for them. The effect is massive. OK, to us, they're whizzing round for them. It's a, a, they're taking a merry stroll because time has slowed down so much for them. Basically, the gamma factor is only significant at very high velocities. You know, if you if you go for a walk to the shops and back, there won't be very much difference in the time it takes. OK, uh, remember that if something isn't moving, then the, the, the gamma factor is one. And then if something is moving, then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. 
And remember, as far as time is concerned, it's the big time divided by the little time. Yes, the big time is the time for the object which isn't moving and T naught is the time for the object which is moving. Uh, if something traveled, here's an interesting idea. If something traveled at the speed of light, for example, a photon, uh, would time have any meaning whatsoever? Because for a photon, uh, the, the gamma factor would be infinite, wouldn't it? And so does time mean anything for a photon if you're traveling at the speed of light? Something, it's not on the specification, but have a think about that. Now, another consequence is length contraction. Uh, I'm not going to talk a great deal about it, but here, uh, gamma is L naught over L. Now, this time, if you're traveling quickly, uh, distances in the direction that you're traveling in, distances get shorter. So length contraction. If you look at the ball, uh, at rest, gamma equals one. The ball is a sphere. As it moves faster and faster, gamma gets bigger and bigger. The, the diameter of the ball horizontally gets smaller and smaller. So again, as a result of uh, special relativity, uh, you get this length contraction as well. And again, here, the gamma factor is the big length, which is not moving divided by the small length, which is moving. 